Welcome to the Sky News Daily. Neil Patterson here. Great to have you with us once again. Today, we're going to return to the Middle East. A year ago, on October the 7th, 2023, Iran-backed Hamas sent its fighters into Israel. 1,200 people were killed by Hamas, a prescribed terrorist group in the eyes of the United Kingdom, the United States and others. Footage shot that day shows brutal, indiscriminate violence. 250 people were taken hostage, of which 97 remain unaccounted for. A year on, we are no closer to a ceasefire than the day after the attacks. In fact, arguably, we are further from it, with the Israeli assault ongoing on another Iranian proxy, Hezbollah in Lebanon. This is a region that knows conflict only too well. So today on the podcast, we want to ask if there is any hope of it ending. Later, our military analysts will give us the historical perspective on the push for peace. But let's start with our Middle East correspondent, Alistair Bunko. He's joining us from Israel. Alistair, good to see you. And we're going to talk about the specifics of where you are in just a second. But, but you and I spoke, I think it was, two days after the October 7th attacks last year. I was at the Labour Party conference. You were obviously in the region. I mean, look, I certainly didn't think a year on this was where we would be. Did you? No, I, I didn't, to be honest. I knew it would be different. We were being told that repeatedly by the Israeli military. But most conflicts between Israel and Hamas had lasted, you know, no more than really two weeks in the past. And then this came and it was different. What happened on October 7th was like nothing Israel had experienced before. But I suppose if I was to guess, I don't know, I probably would have thought it had been over by, by Christmas. I don't think I'm alone in that. I think a lot of um, people here, I think a lot of Western diplomats, the White House, for example, also thought it'd be over by Christmas. We were wrong and perhaps the signs were there. Netanyahu always maintained that he would go out and destroy Hamas. He hasn't done it yet, but that very objective was always going to take more than just a few months. Well, tell us just a little bit about, about where you are, because ordinary Israelis will be reflecting, as indeed the rest of the world is, on, on where we are after 12 months of conflict. But in these reflections, I suspect that some of the atrocities that were committed on that day might just fall through the cracks as people try to understand where this where this war, let's call it what it is, is going next. I'm close to the kibbutz Raim and then the site of the Nova Music Festival, which is where the, the biggest massacre on that day happened. 364 people here were killed, uh, many more wounded, and around 40 were taken hostage and into Gaza. There's still 97 hostages taken on that day being held inside Gaza. The war, and I can hit, just as I was speaking there, there was another artillery round uh, that went from here into Gaza. There's a helicopter, an Apache helicopter, a gunship overhead. We've heard the sounds of war from here all morning. They are still pounding Gaza. And then that has now become, what well, is becoming a major war in Lebanon. So it has changed society here beyond any recognition. It, the last 12 months have been very strange to live through. People have had October the 7th and the war hanging over them. You felt it everywhere. I've spoken to people who have not cut their hair, they've not shaved, they've not eaten chocolate, they've not listened to music for the last 12 months out of solidarity with the people who lost their lives on October the 7th and out of solidarity with the hostages still being held. Today is a moment for Israel and Israelis to reflect, to remember but as long as the war continues, they cannot move on. Given those anecdotal experiences that you have encountered, given the fact that even the secular left has found itself being driven to become more hawkish by the events of that day. I mean, is there a peace movement domestically in Israel, so to speak? Yeah, there is a peace movement, but it's not peace in with the objective of obtaining a two-state solution, for example. I mean, yes, there are people here who will say that there should be a two-state solution. They believe that is the only way forward. There'll be people here who think that the war in Gaza has gone on for too long. But the way I would categorize the peace movement, if, if, if we're going to label it such, is that there is a growing number of people who want a ceasefire in Gaza because it will result in the hostages being released. In practical terms, though, can Israel maintain the tempo 
and the broad nature of the conflict. I mean, you and I are speaking um, uh, uh, Monday, the 7th of October, of course, 12 months on. I mean, given, given the state of the conflict as of this point, ca can Israel keep going? Firstly, on the sort of pure practical level, uh, Israel, the IDF, has a quantitative edge over its enemies. It is better armed, it's larger in size, it's better trained. And that's why they feel that they can take on multiple fronts all at once. But the Israeli military is tired. They have been fighting a very hard war in Gaza. And now they're being asked to fight what is inevitably going to be a very hard war. I think quite a long war as well in Lebanon. And that does take its toll. Uh, there's other areas that are being impacted in society as well. The economy is in a very bad state. A number of credit rating agencies have downgraded the Israeli economy. The shekel, the currency here, has tumbled against the dollar. Uh, a lot of people have left the country because of what is going on. So are those things sustainable? Not indefinitely, no. Where I think it could be sustainable is in the psyche of the Israeli people. They truly believe that what that is happening now is a fight for their own survival, is a fight for the survival of the Jewish state. But the problem is, is this, this conflict began as Israel taking on Hamas. It has now evolved, it has metamorphosed into a regional conflict between Iran and Israel. And I'm now just wondering whether that makes the prospect of there being some sort of regional solution to all of this just one for the birds now. The IDF and Hamas might be the two belligerents, but it's a war between Israel and Gaza, Israel and Lebanon, because civilians, like it or not, are being caught up in both of those conflicts in a very, very big way. And I think what people have to understand, um, particularly here, is that if there ever is to be peace, if ever there is to be security for Israelis, it will require some form of diplomatic solution with the Palestinians. There will be thousands in Gaza right now who will be radicalized because of what they've lived through over the last 12 months. Whether you agree with Israel's war or whether you disagree with it, the reality is there will be young boys and girls who will have lost their parents, their brothers, their sisters, they would have lived through bombardments, they would have been displaced many, many times, and they will grow up to hate Israel, unless, unless there can be years and years of diplomatic maneuvering and investment and patience and time to bring the two sides close enough together so that they can at least live next to each other if not in harmony, at least not in war. Alistair, just before we move on, I keep hearing what sounds like small arms fire. What, what's actually happening? On cue, that's artillery. That's Israeli artillery just off to my right. So they are firing into Gaza. They have been uh, all morning. There are artillery positions here. There's a, an Apache helicopter overhead, and they are firing into Gaza at positions in Gaza. Okay, so I, I wonder then if there is to be not even peace between these these warring parties, but just even a ceasefire, you know, and, and a lasting ceasefire. I wonder if there needs to be another thing in, in addition to the list that you were just mentioning, and that's a different Israeli prime minister, with Benjamin Netanyahu in charge of the country, a man whose whose stated ambition at the moment is to redraw the Middle East. I think Benjamin Netanyahu is a very focused politician. His popularity has ebbed and flowed. At the moment, his popularity is quite high. Uh, I think as a result of Israel's actions in Lebanon, the killing of Hassan Nasrallah, for example. Elections are again in 2026, if not beforehand. I would not bet against Netanyahu being re-elected as prime minister. We'll have to see. Alistair, I hate to put you on the spot, but you know, a year from now, when you and I chat again on the Daily Podcast, I wonder if 12 months from now, we will be updating listeners as to the latest front in the violence, or whether we will be talking about efforts towards securing a more long lasting peace. Where do you fall? I don't see Israeli forces leaving Gaza anytime soon. 
Benjamin Netanyahu has said that he would like another force to come in and secure Gaza and to police Gaza and to provide security for Gaza, but he doesn't know who that is. I think Israeli forces will stay there for a long time. I think maybe Israeli forces will stay in Lebanon for a long time as well. I can see a similar argument being made in Lebanon. Who else is going to keep Hezbollah back from the border if not Israel? The UN has failed to do it. The Lebanese army has failed to do it. So it will need to be Israel. I think these wars are going to go on for a lot longer. Alistair, thank you. We'll be back in a moment with our defence analyst, Professor Michael Clark. Welcome back to The Daily, where, of course, we are continuing to mark one year on from that Hamas 7th of October attack on Israel. Back in the studio with us, our military analyst, Professor Michael Clark. Good to see you, Michael. I mean, what a day to be talking about this. Um, Looking at the Middle East, have you ever known it to be in such tumult for there to be such a risk of, of broader violence? Have we been here before? No, not across the region. We've we've seen bigger wars before. Mm. The biggest was probably 1973, when Israel was nearly eliminated in a sudden attack. Egypt and Syria attacked Israel, the Yom Kippur War, and the Israelis really had to dig deep and then hit back. But I've never known a time when the rest of the Middle East was so affected by the Arab-Israeli conflict. I mean, Iran has only been the sort of state it is since 1979, the Iranian Revolution. But Iran leads the Shia Muslim community and Saudi Arabia leads the Sunni Muslim community. And so there's a, there's a real fault line between, as it were, the, the followers of Khomeini on Shia element of the Muslim religion and Saudi Arabia and the Sunni element. I, I suppose the reason that I'm mentioning this, this kind of almost permanent instability that there is, certainly competing tensions that there will always be, that it is an achievement that we have in the past actually gotten as close to peace as we have. We, we have had peace agreements on the table in the past. Yes, we have, yeah. Um, we have a couple of agreements and we, we've had ceasefires and we've had a, a situation where the whole conflict or the Arab-Israeli conflict was effectively contained. And uh, it was all based on the idea of moving towards a two-state solution. Mm. So to give the Palestinians some authority, the Palestinian Authority was the official um, organization of the Palestinians, to give them authority that they could build on within the occupied territories. Everybody knows what the, what the final deal needs to look like. Do they? Right? Really? Yeah, everybody knows it. A two-state solution okay. um, with uh, Jerusalem as an open city, um, with economic relationships worked out between them, that the Israeli illegal settlements, illegal since 1967, have got to go. Mm -hmm. Uh, And of course, the Israelis would never go along with that. And those settlements have been growing all the time. So the settlements have got to go. Two-state solution, Jerusalem is an open city. And the amount of work that's been done on this, all the detail is worked out. I mean, usually in in peace deals, there's an agreement in principle and the details are the problem. This is the other way around. The details are extremely well known. They're thoroughly gone through by by organizations all over the world and governments. It's just that they can't agree on the fundamentals. We are, we know what it would look like. Can't can't get both sides to agree to actually implement it. Why? Why has that been such a sticking point? Given all the bloodshed, given all the lives lost, given all the opportunity that there is in the Middle East for countries which can put down the arms and pick up the plowshares. Because on the Israeli side, there's never been complete agreement to the idea of a two-state solution. Yeah. The Palestinians were never particularly united. Um, they, they never had a really competent government. And Yasser Arafat, you know, the very well-respected Palestinian leader, mm-hmm. he was not a, a good leader strategically. He, he, he was undermined by the Israelis. And he pushed at the wrong things, I think, even though he got them closer probably to a a Palestinian state than than most. He was distracted by corruption. I mean, Hamas in Gaza, which is an organization that starts in Gaza, wins the elections in Gaza after the Israelis withdraw in 2005 and kicks the Palestinian Authority out. Hamas um, are more popular in the West Bank than the Palestinian Authority. It's true. Um, because they seem to be taking the fight to the Israelis. So, the, the, you know, the fact is that the two-state solution is well worked out, but neither side can really bring themselves to commit to it. When you have an Israeli premier saying things like, this is an opportunity to redraw the Middle East, to, to redesign what this part of the world looks like, I mean, genuinely, what hope for peace? 
Yeah, well, the, the only hope is is the continual the continual turning of the wheel. So, I mean, the wheel went were turned decisively against Netanyahu on the 7th of October. I mean, all of his previous policy had failed. You know, his policy to keep Hamas and the Palestinian Authority divided, his, his, his policy to actually allow Hamas to operate because they didn't do that much harm to mm -hmm. Israel. That was to destabilize what the Palestinian exactly. organizations. Exactly, keep the Palestinians in, in, split. And he could always say, look, Hamas make it impossible to go for a deal. And the Israelis was to say, if you are a Jew in the world and you are uncertain, if you're you know, if you're under threat, come to Israel. Mm -hmm. This is your homeland and you will be safe here. We will keep all Jews safe in their historic biblical homeland. And that policy, you know, w completely collapsed. And so Netanyahu looked as if he was on his last legs mm -hmm. after the 7th of October. And it was his fault. And this is the way war turns the wheels quite quickly. So here we are now. They, they dug in. They've now um, as it reversed the dynamic. And whereas Hamas wanted to create a regional war against Israel... What Hamas have now stimulated is a regional war against Iran, their backer. And the Israelis now think, yes, we can remake the Middle East. By, what they, by which they mean, I think, we can, we can fundamentally improve our security situation. We can kick Hamas back. We can kick Hezbollah back. We can put the, the Iran back several years so that they don't threaten us the way they do. And that will give us a breathing space. But my question is, what are you going to do with the breathing space, Mr. Netanyahu? Yeah. What's your plan? Strategically, though, the, the diminution or the deletion of Iran would surely be a strategic priority shared by, by the United States. Although I suppose we have to wait and see what happens come November and whether yeah. it is Donald Trump uh, taking back the reins at the White House or indeed it's Kamala Harris for the Democrats. Yes, the United States would like to see Iran... Um, contained more eff effectively. But the US knows that a real collapse in Iran would just throw more uncertainty across the Middle East. And so I think they would like to see a managed process of change in Iran. When it comes to peace in the Middle East, and this is a big old region that we're talking about, and there are many competing priorities, strategies, religions, mm. nations, isn't it simply the case that it's just in the best interest of everyone for things to carry on as they have been? That there are militia organisations who can only survive by funding from nation states who want to use them to carry out their own strategic ambitions. That you have countries outside of the Middle East that are quite happy to see bloodshed, tension there, because it means everyone's eyes are focused on what is happening in the Middle East and not what is happening, say, for example, China, Russia, Ukraine, and so on. I mean, it, it, it's it part of the reason that we have never been able to bring about a lasting peace in this area is because, do you know what, it's a bit too much like hard work, and frankly, it's easier if we just carry on doing yeah, this. Yeah, absolutely Watch, right. rinse, repeat. Manage it. Yeah, manage the problem. I mean, the, across the Middle East in general, there has never been Arab unity. And so you, you're dealing with so many different cultures, religions, peoples, interests, and um, oil. <laughs> the Middle East was difficult enough before the 1920s. And suddenly, when oil becomes important, then oil adds another element. They used to say that the problem with the Middle East in the, in the 20th century is that our oil is, behind, is underneath their sand. But the, the Middle East is, is the historical crossroad between Asia and Europe and Africa. It has been a, an area of remarkable differences, mm. differences between people and religions and interests. So it's, and it's been a, a region which has got incredible qualities and warmth and hospitality, yeah. as well as immense reserves of hatred and feuding and revenge. Mm -hmm. And yet, when it comes to trying to create a political solution in a modern way, then you're absolutely right. Management and containment is easier than uh, an, an, a neat and tidy, stabilizing framework. Which, of course, means that the bloodshed, to an extent, will always be something that we would have to be mindful of. And of course, when we're speaking from our broadcast studio in the west of London, thousands of miles away from the conflict. Yeah, easy for us to say that, much harder if you live there. But if you look at it from a, a political and historical perspective, it's hard to see that, that, that a new Middle East will emerge from this. I mean, some new situation will emerge from this. Whether it's an Israeli-dominated one or an Iranian-dominated one or still less an American-dominated one, whatever it is, it won't be something that anyone can fully control. Hmm. Michael, thanks very much. Do let us know your thoughts on the push for peace in the Middle East. Sky News Daily at sky.uk is the email. You can find me on social media as at Sky News Neil. But that's your lot for this edition of The Daily. 
We're back again tomorrow. The World with Richard Engel and Yalda Hakim is a brand new podcast from Sky News. With me, Sky News' lead world news presenter, Yalda Hakim. And me, Richard Engel, Chief Foreign Correspondent for NBC News. Every week, we'll be reporting from the front line of the world's trouble spots and asking the big questions to the world's most important and influential people. Join us for the ground truth to help you understand what is happening in the world today and why it matters to you. So that's The World with Richard Engel and Yalda Hakim. Listen every Wednesday, wherever you get your podcasts.